Some of you were here last weekend, and I was the celebrant of this Mass, and what we did in a special way at the beginning of Mass, we should have done last week, but there was nothing here. <laughs> we couldn't find nails, didn't have the papers to do the ritual, didn't have the prayer. It's like, okay, so we didn't do it. Sorry about that. But it is good to see that you are, as a parish, looking at racism honestly and having a conversation about it because it is one of the evils of the world that must change, must go away, must be reconciled, because that's what all these readings are today about, God's marvelous power to make things right. For instance, I don't know if you got the, the gist of the first reading from the book of Joshua. What's happening is the Jewish people who came out of Egypt free of slavery and celebrated the Passover, went through the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army and chariots and charioteers were drowned and spent 40 years in the desert, had now, at this point in their journey, crossed the Jordan River and are in the Promised Land. In other words, this generation, this new generation, has come back home to the Promised Land God gave to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and that they lost when they went to Egypt. You with me? This is a wonderful, wonderful thing God's done for them. They have come back home. So now they're celebrating, it's the time of the Passover, and they're celebrating with the first fruits of where their new home is. And what happens? The manna stops. For all these 40 years, God fed them daily with manna from heaven. Now they've grown fruit, wheat, flour was made, and Things could be done by their own produce. And they're rejoicing in the wonderful love and mercy of God that has brought them through their terrible sufferings and to the promised land anew. It would be wonderful, that's where things stayed. But the human condition is, although God kept his part of the covenant and brought them home, they do not keep their part of the covenant they will wander from God in sin. They will be defeated and exiled, not once, but twice. And even when Jesus is born hundreds of years later, they're occupied by the Romans. They're not keeping their part of the covenant. But God never stops working with them, never stops working to bring them around. And so God sends Jesus, his son, he didn't listen to the prophets, but he sends Jesus, the word of God, to speak to us and try to reach our hearts so we will keep the covenant. We will be faithful to God. Our response is the beautiful Psalm 34. If you look at me, you can see I like food. This is one of my favorite Psalms. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Taste and see food. It's wonderful. It makes you rejoice, right? Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Bless the Lord at all times. Look at him with you. May be radiant with joy. Your face is never blessed with shame. For when the poor cry out, the Lord hears them, and from all their distress, he saves them. And that's what the scriptures are all about. God constantly coming to our rescue, constantly saving us from distress, constantly working in the lives of his people to bring them around, to know him to love him, and to serve him. What might be the best description of Lent? To know God, to love God, to serve God. What are we doing that's not that way? What are we doing that's disturbing that relationship between God and us? What can we do to change that relationship for the better? Know, love, serve God. The second reading from Paul to the Corinthians. Again, this is about what Jesus has done for us. The, the, the whole reason we celebrate Easter is that Jesus doesn't stay dead. 
dies on the cross, buried, rises from the dead, conquers sin and death and all the ravages of sin and death, conquers them for us, opens for us the way to heaven, shows us the way, the truth, and the life. You follow Jesus, you'll come to share the heavenly home. That's what he's offering us, reconciliation with God. So Paul in the early church reminds people that's what this is all about. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. Old things must pass away. New things have come. So we talked about getting rid of the old thing of racism, prejudice, anger, bitterness, hatred, and moving into a new relationship with one another, no matter what your race or gender or your religious affiliation. You're all brothers and sisters, children of the Heavenly Father. What can we do to reconcile us to Christ in the ministry of reconciliation that is the church? You heard this on Ash Wednesday. We are ambassadors of Christ. God appealing through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For the sake, our sake, he made Jesus, who did not know sin, to be sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We might be made right in our relationship with God through Jesus, his cross, death, and resurrection. The icing on the cake of these readings, if you like that image, is the gospel of the prodigal son. This is God the Father as Jesus sees him. That's extremely important that we learn to see God the Father as Jesus sees his heavenly Father. What do we notice about this Father? He's not angry. He's not bitter. He's holding no grudges against his young, foolish son. He loves him totally and welcomes him home with open arms. Total welcome back home. You are my beloved son. You were dead, physically not dead, but dead and lost in sin in a pigsty. You know, Jewish people have nothing to do with pigs, right? He is feeding the pigs. It couldn't get any lower. It couldn't get any worse for this young man. He has in dire need of figuring out life. And the grace of the Holy Spirit at that moment when he realizes how guilty he is, how awful he's been, is I can return home to my father's house. And I'll say, treat me like a hard man. And the father wouldn't hear of it. He's welcoming his son home with open arms, forgiving him, reconciling him, bringing him back into the loving embrace, put the sandals on his feet, robe on his body, wash him, bathe him, fill the fatted calf, let's have a party. He's a happy father to see his son return. Our heavenly father is happy when we return to him, confessing our sins, telling him of our sorrow, there's more joy in heaven, Jesus says, and over one repentant sinner than over 99 who have no re need to repentance. We bring joy to God the Father by loving and serving him faithfully, but equally we bring joy to the Heavenly Father by coming back to him, realizing his love, trusting in him that he will have mercy on us and forgive us, and we can begin anew, and we can begin over and over and over because we're human, and God knows that. He made us. He knows what we're like. He made those Jewish people. They weren't the best people, but he kept them through the Passover and the slavery in Egypt and through the Red Sea and through the desert, and he brought them home to Israel. This is the God that we're talking about. He never gives up on his people. He loves us through it all. He wants us back. It's up to us to accept that wonderful reconciliation, to get to confession and tell God of our sorrow for our sins and our sorrow for all the things in our lives that aren't of God and get rid of them with God's help so that we can be closer and closer to our God and to his loving embrace. Two weeks left to Lent. What you doing? You're working on things? 
That's my nagging thing to you. You still have at least 14 days to do something about your relationship with God that will bring you peace, reconciliation, strength, peace and happiness, joy, investments of joy today, because it's, this process is in working. It's unfolding, and God's with us every step of the way, and we need to be joyful in that knowledge, in the knowledge that our Father is a loving Father, holds no anger, holds no grudge, holds no hatred to our sinners, but loves us, accepts us, and wants us to do our best, to return to him with all of our minds and hearts and souls. Two weeks. Let's work on loving God, knowing God, loving God, praising God, serving God, and have a great Easter. Amen.